it comes to starvation. I know what I'm doing. Take one of these, walk right out there with the fuse lit and let them take me down. Hey, listen, I've got a question for you. Do you know if anybody's doing any drilling or blasting or anything like that? <laughs> Around here? No, ma'am. Well, I've been getting some really strange readings. I mean, the school's had these machines up here for three years, and we've never recorded anything like this. Well, we'll ask around, uh, you know, see if anyone's heard anything. Man, oh man, you must have been drunk this time. Edgar, get your butt down from there! Jesus. Died of dehydration. Thirst. Well, that doesn't make any sense. That takes a couple of days, doesn't it? Maybe even three or four. You mean he sat up there three or four days? He sat up there and just died of thirst? <sighs> what the shit? Everybody we know between here and Bixby's already dead. Look out! What are they doing? Blasting? Hey! Where are you guys? It's not like there's another road, man! Oh, I'm never gonna believe this. Canyon Road, oh. you are not two hours. Oh my road. god. Is that a snake? It's more like, like an eel to me. Now eels live in the water. Relax. It's dead. Any of those snake things show up here, we make them extinct. Phone's out, the road's out. Must be a million of them! One of them comes near me and I'll just hit him with a five-pound pickaxe. No, you don't understand, Nestor. They come up from underneath the ground and they grab me. Even sense the slightest vibration through the ground, even footsteps. That's how they hunt. You see, they're headed right for us! The 19th of January 1990, Tremors crawled its way to the big screen in the USA and arrived over five months later in the UK. Produced on a small budget of $11 million, it went on to gross over $45 million worldwide. The film was received well by critics who loved the B-movie plot, special effects and its mix of comedy and horror. Tremors made its biggest impact when it came to home video and Laserdisc. It made millions for Universal Studios, which encouraged them to produce four director video and DVD sequels and a short-lived TV series, which I will discuss later. Surprisingly, in Norway, the title Tremors was translated to Worm Summer. That was continuing with a trend because Jaws was called Shark Summer when it came out, so they decided to keep the similar names. Strange, but true. The idea for Tremors was developed in the early 80s by writer Steve Wilson, who was working as an editor on a navy base in the Californian desert. He would often go hiking and one day climbing over some large boulders. He had an idea about what if he couldn't get off this rock, because there was something underground. He jotted down his ideas and concept, and named it Land Shark. Steve and his writing colleague Brent Maddock had some success with their screenplays to Short Circuit 1 and 2, and batteries not included. Their agent asked them if they had any other scripts they wanted to develop. Landshark was the one they chose, and showed the most potential. Their friend and director Ron Underwood, who for the early part of his career was directing educational movies, loved the idea and tried to get it sold to a number of studios. They didn't really show an interest and thought their idea was a bit silly. It was tough in actually explaining and selling the idea of these large worms and what they look like. The name Landshark was later changed to Tremors, and producer Gayland Hurd caught wind of the script doing the rounds and loved the B-movie premise. She presented it to Universal Studios who thankfully supported the idea and wanted to see it get made. 
What also popped up in discussions was the name of these monsters and how they came about. The writers settled on calling them Graboids, but they didn't really want to explain the monsters' background. They had four possible scenarios, such as they were from outer space, radioactive, scientific experiments, or they had always been there and no one had noticed their presence. In the film they had the characters guess all these scenarios, so it's left ambiguous. The difficult task was finding a location for the setting of the film. It had to be accessible to take into consideration hotels for the cast and crew to use and to get to the location in good time. The Californian desert was the best option and filming started in May of 1989. With its tight schedule and budget, the production had to be careful on keeping to their shooting script to avoid cost overruns. The production designer built the entire town, but also made the main store be able to fall apart and shake for the action scenes. For the cast, we have Kevin Bacon playing Valentine, a local handyman who is sick of doing shitty jobs around the town and wants to leave his current job and move on to bigger things with his friend Earl. For years, Kevin considered Tremors a low point in his professional career. He couldn't believe he was making a movie about underground worms and often had nightmares about them during the shoot, spooking out his then pregnant wife. But thankfully over the years, he has warmed to the movie and was debating about returning to the franchise with a new TV series. But so far, any news on it has fizzled out. Fred Ward plays Earl, Val's best friend. Earl is the wiser one of the pair. And like his friend, he is sick of the town and wants to leave. Him and Val always play rock, paper, scissors to make any decisions, with Earl mostly winning the bet to get himself out of doing anything. Finn Carter plays Rhonda, a student who is out in the desert studying the seismic activity and is the first to determine how many graboids are in the area. She later joins Earl and Val as they combat the giant worms and takes a liking to Val. The movie originally had a slightly different ending. It didn't have Val and Rhonda kissing. The test audiences weren't happy and wanted to see them finally get together so they reshot a new ending to please the audience. It was a lesson the director learned. Sometimes it's best to listen to feedback. It may have not been the ending he wanted, but it helped the movie have a more positive finale. Michael Gross plays Bert, a paranoid survivalist. Michael had just finished playing the dad in the popular TV show Family Ties. The director thought he wouldn't be right for the role, but didn't realize he had such great range as an actor. He blew the director away with his audition. The character of Burt became one of the most popular characters and returned for the many sequels and TV show. Reba McIntyre plays Heather, Burt's wife. Reba was an extremely popular country singer who wanted to get into acting. The director heard she wanted to audition for the part of Heather and he was reluctant to cast her because he wanted actors with experience, not singers. But he was really surprised by her personality and the audition and was sold on her and felt she was perfect for the part. Reba provides the song Why Not Tonight for the end titles. I'm not really a fan of country music, but she is a bloody good singer. We have Victor Wong playing Walter, who runs the supermarket and bar in the small town. Robert Jane plays Melvin, a bored teenager who enjoys winding up the other residents of the town. Charlotte Stewart plays Nancy and Ariana Richards as Mindy. This was one of Ariana's early roles before she became famous for her part in Jurassic Park. Finally, we have Tony Gennaro as Miguel, who spends most of his time hanging around the store, chatting with Walter, debating about where the Graboids came from. The movie opens with Val and Earl, who work as handymen in a small isolated ex-mining town in the desert of the Nevada mountains. They are getting tired of their jobs and working for little money and need to get away to venture onto greater things. They bump into a student who is studying the area for seismic activity. She questions them about the rumblings and disturbances going on. Val and Earl don't have a clue but will let her know if they find anything. They finally pluck up the courage to leave town. As they do, they spot their friend Edgar on top of an electrical tower clutching a rifle. They manage to get him down and take his dead body to the local doctor, who confirms he died of dehydration. They are left baffled as to why he stayed up there for so long until he died. They venture on out of the town and are shocked to see loads of sheep having been cut to shreds and eaten alive. They look for the farmer, old Fred, and spot his hat on the floor. They run over and remove it and find his head sticking out of the sand. Val and Earl freak out and head back to the town to warn the others. Along the way, they bump into some road workers and warn them there is a crazed killer on the loose. They think Val and Earl are talking rubbish and continue working. One of the diggers cuts through into the ground and orange blood oozes out of the top. Then the force underground causes a rock slide, killing the workers. Val and Earl get back to the town but find the phone lines are dead and the only road out of town is now completely blocked by a rock slide. 
Val and Earl are unaware a snake-like creature has grabbed the truck's rear axle, but it gets torn off as Val accelerates fast to break free. They have no choice but to head back to the town and change their method of transport to horses. They notice the snake-like creature hanging on the back of the truck, which leaves everyone spooked. In fear of bumping into more, they take some guns for protection. They come upon Dr. Wallace and his wife's buried station wagon near their trailer, but the couple are missing. As they press on, the horses get freaked out and Val and Earl get thrown, and the snakes that have been following them attack the horses. Then suddenly, a ginormous worm explodes out of the ground. The pair run for their lives as they get chased by the worm. The chase suddenly ends when the creature violently rams itself into the concrete wall of an aqueduct and dies on impact. Rhonda, who they bumped into earlier, stumbles onto the scene after tracking the seismic activity. She discovered previous recordings and confirms there are three other worms, later renamed Graboids in the area. After being chased and trapped overnight atop a cluster of boulders near one of the creatures, they eventually escape by pole vaulting from one boulder to the other to reach Rhonda's car. Once they get back to the town to inform the others, Val figures out the Graboids are coming directly for them. For the movie's limited budget, they really knock it out of the park for its visual and special effects. The filmmakers try to get all the effects done within camera. The movie takes advantage of all the techniques available to them. Illusion Arts provide the matte paintings that open the movie and the one that features during the finale. One or two optical effects are also used. Animatronics, puppets and miniatures handled the bulk load of the work. Producer Gail Ann Hurd recommended Alec Giddis and Tom Woodruff, who ran Studio ADI to do the monster effects. This was when Tom and Alec were still setting up their studio to start their own business, so it was the early days of ADI. Their early designs looked a bit too much like a penis, which caused a lot of laughter from the female crew, so they had to change it and also try and avoid comparisons to the sandworms in Dune. They included these tentacles that come out of the Graboid's mouth to grab onto its victims, and because they lived underground, they needed an armoured head to dig through the sand. I did laugh at the end though, when the worm cracks through the mountain to its death, it does look like a massive turd. Tom and Alec also built one full-scale Graboid for the film, which is seen early on when it kills itself as it slams into the wall. The other ones they built were from the top up, so that they could be pushed up through the ground with a hydraulic rig. Three full-scale mechanical tentacles were produced, and one small one to interact with the actors, mostly for the close-ups when Kevin Bacon is standing still to avoid any noise. The Skotak brothers, Dennis and Robert, handled the miniatures. They had worked with producer Gail Lanherd on Aliens and The Abyss. They had difficulty trying to match the lighting, as the film is mostly set during the day. It became a challenge to make the miniatures match in light and colour. The most impressive sequence was having the Graboids smash through Bert's house, which was done with a hydraulic rig, and then it cuts to miniatures. One of the best effects is when Bert drops his gun, and it seamlessly cuts in one shot and whip pans to a miniature. A very clever technique. When a miniature is used, you can see a change in photography, which they did explain was tough to match, especially for those shots out in the desert, but I love it. Nothing beats a good miniature, and the Skotak brothers always do a good job. For a budget of $11 million, it looks like a $30 million film. Incredible work by the FX teams involved. The composer credited to scoring Tremors is Ernest Troost, who worked on movies such as Dead Heat, One Man's Hero and Nightcomer. He has composed scores to a wide range of feature films and TV shows. His score for Tremors was initially rejected, however. The studio didn't like what he produced, and composer Robert Folk was brought on board to provide a new score. But to his shock, on the second day of working, they had moved the release date forward, giving him only a week to compose the new music. They tried to replace as much music as they could, but not all of it in time. About two thirds of new music was completed. Robert didn't take credit on the film because there was an apparent clause in the original composer's agreement and Robert didn't want a shared credit, but he loved working on the film. You can hear the difference between the two scores throughout the film. It's pretty easy to point them out. Ernest's music very much plays up that country western theme, which is familiar to these types of movies with that backdrop. And he also provides some of the creepy moments of the score that occur in the first act. Robert's work is very much on the action side of things, big orchestral cues that take over when the Graboids attack. Robert also employs a lot of synthesizers mixed into the orchestral music. I certainly prefer Robert's contributions to the score. Ernest's is a kind of a mixed bag. The slower, more eerie moments work a treat, but the music, especially for the pole vaulting scene, seems a bit too joyful and out of place with the rest of the music. 
The soundtrack was released on CD in limited numbers in 2000, featuring Ernest's work plus some additional music from the movie Blood Rush, but no digital release on iTunes or Amazon as of yet. There are lots of bootlegs floating around the net featuring the music from both composers, but sadly no remastered complete score is available to purchase. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Tremors received four sequels over the years and a TV series. And before I get to my final thoughts on the first movie, let's go through some of the sequels. Tremors 2 Aftershocks arrived in 1996, produced on a budget of $4 million. They intended to produce it on a large budget for a theatrical release, but for whatever reasons, things were downscaled and it was released direct to video and Laserdisc. The sequel has Earl Bassett returning from the first movie and Burt Gummer. Earl is hired to deal with a graboid infestation at a Mexican oil field and enlists the help of Burt when he is outnumbered. The co-writer of the first movie, Steve Wilson, directs it. Studio ADI returned to produce the creature effects and Phil Tippett's CGI division produced a CG visual effects for the new little graboid creatures called Shriekers, who can now live above ground. For a director video release, it's a very polished film. It could have easily been given a theatrical release, but it wouldn't have had the strong reception as the original. It's perfectly enjoyable, it's got its problems of course, it doesn't quite match in its visuals and direction to the original, but it's an adequate follow-up. It just lacks some bacon. Five years later we got Tremors 3 back to perfection, made with a slightly larger budget at $6 million. The series was now intended for home video. The poster is hilariously bad. It looks like a kid photoshopped it on his school lunch break. Fred Ward doesn't return this time, but a few more characters from the original come back. Michael Gross, of course, as Burt, takes the main lead, but also Tony Gennaro, Charlotte Stewart, Ariana Richards and Robert Jane return. Robert played Melvin in the original and is now redeveloping the land and wants to take down Perfection Valley. The other writer of Tremors, Brent Maddock, takes over as director. It introduces a new creature called the Ass Blasters. They are capable of flying by farting, no, I'm not joking, and let rip, so to speak, an explosive push to make them take off. They also lay eggs to produce more graboids. Burt Gummer returns to his hometown of Perfection, Nevada, after a hunt for Shriekers in Argentina. The town's own equipment for tracking graboids has fallen into disrepair due to neglect and no attacks have been made on the town in 11 years. Walter Chang's market has been taken over by his niece Jody, and the town has gained a new resident called Jack who creates mock attack tours for visiting tourists. During one of Jack's tours they are attacked by a real graboid, thus sets in motion the attack on the town. It's nice to see the movie have its original setting, but it's a bit of a bore to sit through and there is a heavy reliance on CGI which unfortunately looks pretty bad. In 2003, a television series was produced and premiered on the Sci-Fi Channel. Apparently the episodes were originally aired out of order, which makes no sense, but when it was repeated it was broadcast in sequence. The series picks up after the events of Tremors 3 and it introduces the character of Cletus played by the legendary Christopher Lloyd. It follows the residents of Perfection Valley attempting to coexist with a graboid because they are now deemed to be an endangered species. Well, it's basically an excuse for people to be put in danger each episode. The show also deals with mad scientists and corrupt real estate developers to avoid each episode being too repetitive. The show does look a lot like the original film with its photographic look, which is nice. I watched a few episodes and it's alright. It's not as bad as I expected, but the visual effects are total rubbish and they try to avoid showing the Graboid that much to keep costs down. To be honest, I don't think it needed a TV series or let alone more sequels, but hey, there is an audience for it, thus we keep getting more and more spin-offs. In 2004, another film was produced on a budget of $5 million called Tremors 4 The Legend Begins, directed by Steve Wilson, and it served as a prequel to the series and featured Michael Gross as the ancestor to his original character Bert. Set in 1889, the inhabitants of the town Perfection, originally called Rejection, are relying on the income of a nearby silver mine. One day, a hot spring causes graboid eggs to hatch, resulting in the death of 17 miners. Gummer is the owner of the mine and arrives in the town to fix the problem. He is a total snob and doesn't like guns however, well to start with anyway, so he employs a gunfighter to do his dirty work. The film tries to move away from CG and brings back more practical effects which was very cool to see. The movie doesn't entirely avoid CG however, but it's used more sparingly than Tremors 2 and 3. 
In October of 2015, Tremors 5 Bloodlines arrived on Blu-ray and DVD. It was produced in South Africa. Michael Gross is back yet again and is joined with a new co-star, Jamie Kennedy. And the movie picks up after the events of Tremors 3. Brent Maddock and Steve Wilson declined to be involved due to the lack of creative control over the project and Don Michael Paul handled the directing duties. Bert Gummer, now a star in his own survivalist series, is approached to deal with ass blasters in South Africa. Upon arrival, Bert's heavy weaponry is impounded due to South African gun laws, and he and his colleague are instead equipped with tranquilizers. They set up their quarters at an animal refuge. Meanwhile, at a dig site, two scientists celebrate after finding the fossilized remains of a graboid. Investigating the scene, Bert sees the fossils and realizes that it's a different breed of graboid. The ass blasters appear to have been redesigned and the CGI, to my surprise, was pretty good for a low budget production. Going through all these sequels, I thought they were going to be really bad and poorly made, but they are pretty decent. They are not amazing by any standards or highly recommended, but they are watchable and for the most part entertaining schlock. I've seen some terrible director video sequels in my time, but Tremors hasn't fallen into that trap as of yet, in my opinion, of being a waste of one's time. You don't feel like you've wasted 90 minutes of your life sitting through one of them. If you see them going super cheap, then grab them. But if I had to recommend a particular movie, I would say Tremors 2 and 4 are worth seeking out. Even the last one, number 5, has some merits. I wasn't particularly keen on the third movie, however, but give them all a go if you are interested in the slightest. I probably wouldn't seek out the TV series, but if you own most of the sequels, then it wouldn't hurt to watch it. I saw Tremors not long after its VHS release. I'm not entirely certain if my family rented it or we saw it on cable TV, but it was very much part of my youth. It's a film I watched a lot and appreciated at the time, and over the years my fondness for it has never changed. It's one of the perfect films to watch on a Saturday evening. It's got the comedy, the jump scares, big creatures and the suspense to give you a satisfying experience. It's basically Jaws with sand instead of water. I don't think it's objectively as good as Jaws. But for me, if I had to pick between the two to watch, I would probably say Tremors. Mostly down to its great use of comedy, with the chemistry between Kevin Bacon and Fred Ward. I think they really keep you engaged throughout the film. With the movie's heavy use of special effects, it doesn't let them take over the film, so it just becomes this roller coaster ride of set pieces, with the characters getting lost in the mayhem. The film keeps the characters central, so it doesn't lose its focus. I think the beauty of these types of movies is the first act. When you have the main protagonist trying to discover what's going on, the mystery and sense of suspense and suspicion really keeps you engaged in the story. If the first act didn't work in creating this build-up, it would fall flat on its face. Ron Underwood and the writers make the right decision to keep the graboids off camera for the right amount of time, until its big reveal. You have those low camera shots as you kind of have the POV of the worms tracking its next victim, but in reality, it doesn't make sense as the POV is above ground, but it's the only way to get across that people are being followed by the graboids. I've never really had any problems with the film. You could make some arguments on how the town still operates. All the residents kind of reside around the shop, and how do the locals earn any money? Do the kids go to school? It seems like a town shut off from society. There is one road that leads out of the town, and is probably where most of them work and it could be the summer and everyone is taking time off. That is probably the best explanation I can think of. There is probably a handful of things you can nitpick, but at the end of the day, it's just nitpicking that doesn't amount to anything or destroy your enjoyment of the film. Also, you have debates about where the Graboids come from. They could have explained more about their history and why they've never been discovered before. I know the sequels explore and expand upon that and introduce new creatures, but they end up falling into that trap of giving away too much information and the mystery of how they become what they are, or how they evolved over time, usually ends up being spoiled by a weak or unoriginal explanation. Where they come from isn't really important, they are just there to serve the plot in providing this monster movie that was supposed to be a one-off thing. In some ways it reminds me of a Joe Dante film. If you didn't know who made it, and had to guess, I'm sure Joe's name would pop up, because Joe was such a fan of those 1950s B-movies, this feels like a modern update or homage to that silver age of sci-fi cinema. It has the desert backdrop that was always so familiar to the nuclear fallout or atomic monster movies, and this feels like a nice companion piece. Tremor's strongest aspect is its humour. 
which is mostly down to Kevin Bacon, whose outbursts of anger or watching him jump for joy as he sees a Graboid get destroyed, he really excels with his reactions. It's a shame he didn't have faith in the movie, but despite his negative opinion on it, he really delivers a good performance. The film is not really gross or that graphic. It's a 15 or say R rated movie that came with a large amount of swearing, which had to be cut down further before its release to avoid getting anything stronger, but it serves enough horror to balance everything out. Tremors to me never gets dull, and I always return to it a couple of times a year, and still get a lot of enjoyment out of it. I'm not surprised it spawns so many sequels. There is obviously a strong fan base for this franchise, which I'm sure the original writers and director didn't expect. Sequels always tend to rinse and repeat the same plot. It can work in some cases, but as we saw with the Jaws sequels, it's often best left alone. One sequel, yeah, you can get away with, but four sequels in total and as TV series is definitely a bit too much for me. Tremors didn't attempt to do anything original. Going with a different monster is the only real thing it adds to the genre, so to speak. It just does what Jaws did and does its own take on it. There is nothing wrong with that, many movies borrow ideas from others, but as long as it provides something fresh whilst doing a twist on a familiar genre, then it should succeed, as Tremors did. Tremors is very easy to get hold of, it's been re-released a number of times on DVD and Blu-ray. All the special features however have not changed since the 1996 Laserdisc Signature Collection release. They just often change the cover slightly and hey, it's a new edition but it's a very affordable disc, it's kind of a budget release from Universal. The picture and sound quality is pretty good for the Blu-ray. There is the inherent issue that pops up on a lot of Universal's back catalogue of films, they often tend to overdo it with the sharpness. It's like someone's put the sharpness setting up to 11, which is a bit off-putting. Tremors was a great film to kickstart the 90s, and with its huge use of practical and in-camera effects, it stood up over time. For a film that is 26 years old, it's aged well. There have been more monster movies over the years, but they never seem to capture the right tone or say balance of ingredients to make a solid movie like Tremors. I think this film manages to tick all the right boxes to please the most stubborn viewer. If you haven't seen Tremors, grab it as soon as you can and watch it with a few beers and a greasy takeaway and your evening will be sorted. Also, Tremors could be a good double bill with Jaws. Now that sounds like a good plan. I got it. There are mutations caused by radiation. Or no, no, no. Government built them. Big surprise for the Russians. Well, there's nothing like them in the fossil record, I'm sure. Okay, so they predate the fossil record. Well, that'd make them a couple of billion years old. And we've just never seen one till now. Right. I vote for outer space. No way these are local boys. Shit! It's been waiting here all this time? I mean, how's it know we're still here? Well, it's got no eyes, right? Sure as hell can't smell us underground. I say it's been listening. Of course. It senses seismic vibration. It can hear every move we make, especially on this rock. It's a perfect conductor. Bert, get out of your basement. Take your radio. You and Heather, get up on your roof. We'll talk later, okay? Over. Up on the roof? Val, what are you talking about? Damn it, Bert. Just listen to him. Something's wrong. Bert, Jesus Christ! Get up on your roof. The things, they're, they're, they're under the ground. They're bigger than we thought. They're huge. They're coming right after you guys. They're coming right now. We don't see anything, Val. Then what the hell are you talking about? Over. Bert, they're under the ground. They're under the ground. Hurry!
If you enjoyed the video, you can find more on my YouTube channel. And also you can follow me on Twitter. If you want to help support the channel, you can donate through Patreon and receive monthly perks such as updates on the latest news on my channel, early access to reviews and commentaries before they go live on YouTube. Even the smallest donation can help keep this channel going. Thank you.